As Syria comes closer to descending into a full-blown civil war and Kofi Annan's peace plan flounders, what can the United States do to stop the violence? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. Thousands have been killed since the revolt against the rule of Syria's President Bashar al-Assad began in March of last year, and there's no sign of the misery abating. On Friday, the UN's human rights chief said the killing of over 100 civilians in Hula last weekend may have been a crime against humanity. Navi Pillay also warned Syria is in danger of descending into a civil war that could destabilize the entire region. And former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has said he is impatient and frustrated at President Assad's failure to implement his UN brokered peace plan. There's been fresh violence on Friday with Syrian security forces opening up on thousands of protesters who took to the streets to mark the Hula killings. There are also reports that 13 factory workers were executed by supporters of the Assad regime in the west of the country on Thursday. As President Putin visits France and Germany, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has been making no secret of her frustration at the role of Russia, who, along with China, have opposed the adoption of a tough U.N. Security Council resolution against the Assad regime. I repeat the appeal that I have made uh, to Russia uh, because their position of uh, claiming not to take a position is certainly viewed uh, in the Security Council in Damascus and elsewhere as a position supporting the continuity of the Assad regime. And if Russia is uh, prepared, as President Putin's remark seems to suggest, uh, to work with the uh, international community to come together to plan a political transition, we will certainly be uh, ready to cooperate. I will be meeting in Istanbul toward the end of next week with representatives of a lot of the regional uh, countries that are deeply concerned about what's uh, happening. Uh, so if, uh, uh, the, if Russia is prepared to help us implement all of the six parts of Kofi Annan's uh, plan, uh, we are prepared to work with them to do so. So is it time for the international community to intervene to stop the violence? And should the United States lead that effort? I'm joined in the studio by Tom Pickering, a former U.S. ambassador to Israel and the United Nations, and also John Alterman, a former Middle East policy advisor at the U.S. State Department who directs the Middle East program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And from Chicago, Marzen Asbahi is government affairs director for the Syrian Expatriates, a U.S.-based organization that looks to support the Syrian opposition. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Ambassador Pickering, is Syria now reaching some kind of tipping point where the violence would get even more horrific that the international community, with the United States in the lead, will be compelled to take some kind of military action? I think so. I, let me just say, for purposes of balance, you should have mentioned I was also ambassador to Jordan. But I think Syria is reaching a tipping point. It appears to me that if something isn't done, we have a very good chance either of more continuing massacres with some opposition, or if more is done to arm the opposition and to help them get together, which I think is a, is a principal problem, uh, we could see this move gradually, but I think inexorably, into a kind of civil war. It may be a civil war of ink blots, that is, locations around Syria where they're beginning to build opposition. Syria is a hard place to hide, so it's difficult to make that happen. But there is a chance, in my view, uh, for something along the lines that Fareed Zakaria proposed and that we have been trying for some time. And I think the Secretary's pressure on the Russians and indeed Putin's not totally unhelpful response that he was prepared to try to avoid a civil war and to support the Anand plan at least gives us an opportunity for one more shot at what I would call a combination of very stiff sanctions, full isolation of Syria, and something that I would like to call a quarantine, but it would resemble a blockade by land, sea, and air. I think that those are the things that are going to make Assad understand that the choices are very stark for him, that he can't get away with Russian and Chinese help 
by continuing to murder his own people and think the rest of the world is going to sit back because they're concerned about another conflict in the region. But I would certainly go all out on sanctions, isolation, quarantine, blockade, whatever you want to call it, to put maximum pressure on Syria as quickly as possible. It's the one thing that can help the Russians requite what was a terrible mistake and which has now linked them as a sponsor, in my view, of Assad's massacres. Okay, let's go to Mazen Asbahi in uh, Chicago. Mazen, do you think there's still time for this kind of diplomatic slash uh, quarantine track that the ambassador is talking about? Well, I, I think that the quarantine idea might be something worth exploring. Uh, I think that the opposition and the international community has lost patience uh, and has lost hope in any semblance uh, or chance that the Assad regime would agree to a negotiated settlement. If there was some hope that that could happen, even with Russian uh, pressure on Assad, uh, then we should pursue that. But it hasn't been forthcoming, and yet the brutality continues, the deaths continue, uh, 37, I believe, today. You know, at what point do we stop thinking that the Assad regime is willing to negotiate? General Altman, what are the options for the United States right now? I mean, does it offer these, uh, you know, diplomatic track, but at the same time carry a big stick and saying if that doesn't work, then, you know, a military action is going to become inev inevitable? Well, I think that there's a whole range of options, both on the diplomatic side and the military side. There's overt, there's covert. I think that there are a lot of options. The question, I think there, there are probably two questions. Um, one is, what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to get Assad to reform? As in said, there's no hope of Assad reforming. But you have to decide, are you trying to get something with this government or with a future government? And I think the other thing you have to think about is, what is your time frame? We have been gotten very used after Tunisia went from one position to another in six weeks, after Hassan Mubarak fell in Egypt in only 18 days. There's a sense that if only we find the right key, we put in the door, we turn the lock, and you're going to have a total change in Syria, you're going to be able to fix the problem of Bashar al-Assad in a matter of weeks. I don't think there is a key. As I look at a military insurgency in particular, we have fought military insurgencies for decades. We fought a military insurgency in Afghanistan for a decade. We supported a military insurgency in Nicaragua for a decade. We had a military presence in Iraq for almost a decade. We have one in Afghanistan for more than a decade. This sense that we can just do it and it'll be a few weeks and we'll be done, I don't buy it. I think if we are thinking we are willing to invest 10 years in Syria, mm -hmm. That leads you to one set of policies. If you're going to say, you know, Syria might do this much, but not more, I think that leads you to another set of policies. But there's no appetite for that in, in the United States. For, for a 10-year engagement in Syria? Right. I don't think there is. Okay. Um, I, nod, I nod. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to add, I think John's making a great point. Uh, when you think about timelines and how you shape policy with respect to that timeline, I think it's very important to consider who is the Syrian opposition, how broadly supported is the uprising in Syria. And I think that as people ha get to know uh, and study the opposition closely, and I mean the internal opposition in particular, they're finding that there is incredibly wide support uh, and that there is increasing cohesion and cooperation between the various political parties. And that goes a long way in showing that the regime's strengths are deteriorating uh, quickly and that there are opportunities to hasten things with strategic policy decisions. But I think yeah, let me add two yeah, points okay, on here. Right. <laughs> I agree with most everything's been said. Mazen has put out kind of a challenge because the sense that I have, particularly inside the U.S. government, is a deep concern that with the Russian and Chinese veto, the people who were preparing to split from Assad are now still firmly with him and that the notion that an opposition in which there are increasing reports of internal fighting is triumphing on the ground by their mere opposition over Assad is maybe a hope against reality at this stage. I'd also, I, I agree with practically everything that John has said. It'll disappoint John, but, <laughs> but it's true. Uh, and, and a number of wise things. I think from the beginning, we have chosen the option if Syria without Assad, if we can find a way to do it. I think the question of timing 
is a more difficult one. Uh, to some extent, timing plays a role in terms of our domestic politics in this, as it does in Iran right. and a number of other questions. And, and to some extent, there is a kind of growing sense, I was in Capitol Hill yesterday, that they would like to find a way immediately, instantly, to stop the massacring and to get rid of Assad. Well, on the other hand, the other part of their brain is now totally fixed on the other point that John raised, that they don't want another war in Asia. Certainly, they don't want another land war in Asia. And I think that John is right. There are a range of options, and I tried to sketch out a few of them. Mm -hmm. Between where we are now, which is stuck, is the best kind of phrase for it, and full all-out war, including international involvement, which I think very few people in this country seriously would want when they think about it. Right. The, the other piece, and, and I think Mazin pointed I, out, and it's exactly right, this question of where is the Syrian public support, I think the Syrian public support at this point is a work in progress. Just a week ago, I was speaking to an ambassador currently based in Damascus. Yeah. That ambassador's assessment is 30% of Syrians are for the regime, 30% of Syrians are bitterly opposed to the regime, 40% of Syrians are terrified this is all going to hell, but they don't know what to do about it. Part of this mm -hmm. has to be persuading a larger number of Syrians that changes in their interest, change will improve their interests. I think they're unconvinced. And there is not yet the sort of overwhelming support that we saw in Tunisia and Egypt. But John, there is, your, your I disagree. Is, right, I, I disagree. Middle, I disagree yeah. strongly. We'll go I'll, I'll come to you when they moment, see the also. process moving in a defined direction. That or is, they have confidence yes. in it. Exactly. They're on the fence, but they're ready to slide over if the opposition can show through itself and through its international support and through a cohesive effort against Syria that it's making progress. But there's also okay. a problem that right. there's, sort of, like there's a fear. Like there's, okay, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment. There, there is a, a class fear, a right. sense that this is. is country bumpkins mm -hmm. who are coming from homes in other cities, right. from the, per, the peripheral areas. They're going to take away everything that the middle no. classes in the cities have, have built. And no, I think I unless we can okay. address okay. that, well, I unless we with can you. address that. Go, go oh, ahead. Yeah. Let, allow me, allow me just, a, just a few seconds to make yeah. a couple points. One is that I think there's a lot stronger public support for the opposition and the revolution generally. We've seen strong support among the young, the educated, the Aleppo uh, uh, protests with the students. Uh, Damascus, there's incredible support even there, though security is harder. Um, and so one other thing that I wanted to point out is you're seeing increased cohesion among the internal opposition, you have an announcement just yesterday of the creation of provincial military councils in 10 of the 14 provinces that are working hand in hand with the higher revolutionary councils, which are civilian led. And there is extremely uh, active efforts to bring the armed opposition under civilian command but and Mazen, control. You mentioned, you they mentioned, are led by yeah. officials. Okay, you mentioned something just of the now, Assad regime, former soldiers. which was that the opposition mm -hmm. is very diverse. I mean, surely that is a problem for the United States and its allies. If Bashar al-Assad is going to be replaced, who replaces him? If you've got this opposition, which is diverse, which is fragmented, will they start fighting among themselves for control of the country? I think you're finding increased cohesion in the provinces on the ground. I think we're being distracted by an exile-led leadership outside in other countries where those individuals, although they've got incredible track records of dissident, of being leading dissidents of the Assad regime, you have to look to the ground to see innate organic leadership coming up through the local revolutionary councils in the provinces and in the cities. And those people are recognized. Remember that the FSA is growing. It's about 60,000 or so soldiers currently active and they are made up of about 20% defectors, professional soldiers, and the rest, 80%, are civilian fighters who, guess what, those are the sons uh, of the neighborhoods that they're defending. This is a much deeper popular revolt than I think many analysts in the West are giving credit. You know, on the other side, and I, and I think Mazen has obviously got a point of view and he's providing us with what he believes to be the case inside Syria. It, it stretches credulity a little bit, but I accept 
John's point that 30% at a minimum probably is in opposition and the other 40% is waiting to go when the time changes and is not going to declare themselves in advance because they know the consequences. But the real question is that the question we answered months ago, do we want Syria to continue under Assad? Having selected the alternative, we are now in a position of obviously having to play cards with the aces, the leadership not in the deck yet. And that's something we have obviously wrestled with in the past. Uh, we wrestled with it I in Afghanistan until in fact we had almost complete control of the country in 2001 and 2002. And then we went for Karzai. And you can, you can say that was either a good or a bad alternative. Um, but it did produce some kind of result. Uh, and my feeling is that in a situation where the Assad family ruled Syria for 30, 35 years as an absolute dictatorship with a very repressive arrangement. The notion that people would be sticking out as leaders with real popularity is an expectation beyond reality. Uh, but the truth is that it seems to me impossible to believe that there will be any reform. What I think needs to get into our diplomacy is a little bit of a combination of pressure and indeed uh, 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 steps that are going to persuade people. Look, I, I would have no problem at all myself with telling the Russians quietly, we don't care what arrangements you make for your Navy with the successor regime in Syria. I really don't care. And I don't think the U.S. Navy really cares. The notion that they can't find a place to refuel in the Mediterranean, they have hardly a real Navy. Uh, but the, their presence in the region over time has not been unhelpful. They've worked with us on some things in the naval area that have been useful. So, so I would look what, at that. But what, the other yeah. thing I would mm -hmm. do, which I don't think we have done enough of, is that I would start feeding the Alawites the notion that the international community will not stand by to watch them murder their fellow citizens, nor their fellow citizens murder them. And we then have to find a way to, to do that. It is the, the, the notion that we are going to get tough in a situation where steps that can be taken before military action have not yet been taken and where I think can, they can have a serious effect, that's what right. we have to be doing. John, wouldn't that entail sending in peacekeeping troops to keep the two sides apart? Um, I think there, there are probably a lot of ways to do it. You may need peacekeeping troops. I'm not sure where they'd necessarily be from. Yeah. I think when we look at the Russian position, I don't think we've thought nearly enough about the Russian position. I think the Russians have interests in Syria. Bashar happens to serve them. Bashar is not the only way to serve Russian interests. I actually think there's a lot of overlap between the U.S. and Russia in terms of the things we're afraid of. In Syria, the Syria, the Russians are terrified of a jihadi regime taking over or jihadi groups having a serious base in Syria. We can work with them on that. I think the key difference with Russia, as I understand it, is the Russians feel if we move too quickly, Syria will tip into, cha into chaos, and the Americans feel if we move too slowly, Syria will tip into chaos. Which is exactly the point made by Hillary Clinton. And, and so, and so, and, and I think, you know, know, the, the president think, is going to meet with Putin. I, I think you're not later giving Syrians enough what? credit. Yeah. Uh, when, when, what I'm hearing is I really don't feel that uh, people are giving the Syrians, the Syrian people on the ground, that much credit. I mean, this is an incredible story. This is an incredible uprising of people who've gone a year of organized, creative uh, ci civil dis uh, disobedience. Uh, peaceful protests, uh, professional uh, rebel force in the in, in the forming. Monson, um, look, if this you is could, not if you two sides that you that you. If you could guarantee the Syrian people are going to get rid of Assad, the United States and the Russians would dance together in the streets. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I think that's the position of uh, of the U.S. administration that Assad has lost all legitimacy. Does, but and I mean, on his you're way saying, out. look, let's look it's to the people of, of Syria to do this and. I would applaud it, but I, I don't think we yet see enough what, of what I would call reality about that conclusion that the people of Syria are capable of dislodging the Assad regime. And the international community, out of sympathy the, with the, the people the, of Syria, has tried to take on some of the burden of forcing the, the pressure sure. on Assad through the Russians and sure. others to move to an electoral scenario, which can then, sure. I hope, requite the wishes the, that, that you've there, expressed. There, 
Sure. There are major areas within Syria that are essentially free zones, where the Assad army is not even able to enter for fear that they'll lose too many uh, of their soldiers. And I think that's that way indicative. For years and years. Right? Maybe there have been areas with, with smugglers and others that have not been under the control of the central government for years. Areas no, of traditional not opposition this, not to the Assad regime. Level. Not at this level. Okay, well, let's, let's I, look I at... I think it's not just about yeah. the Syrian people. They need to be given some tools to make the fi fight a fairer fight. All right, one moment there. Let's look at the one uh, effort that's been made, the one diplomatic effort, the Kofi Annan yeah. uh, mediation. Now, he has expressed his frustrations regarding the conflict. Let's listen to what he said. I know we are all impatient. We are all frustrated by the violence, by the killings. So am I. I think perhaps I'm more frustrated than most of you, because I'm in the thick of things and would really want to see things move much faster uh, than it, it has done. Is that Kofi Annan telling us that his mission is essentially dead? No, he's saying yeah. the mission and its future is in your hands, mm -hmm. that I've done what I can. And he has. He's put together a plan which is reasonable. He's got lip service from everybody. Now he needs to get real what I would call leg drive. Uh, and here I thought the secretary fasting on the Russians in the beginning of a dialogue over the airways with Putin and what I think is their growing embarrassment that they have now become the authors and patrons of a murderous regime killing its own people is very uncomfortable for my friends in Russia. And it ought to be. It right. was not a wise idea to block the, the UN resolution on the notion that somehow it would be twisted into the use of force. And we all know why they did it. John was very clear on that. They have assets and they have arrangements in Syria they want to try to protect. But when they're going down the drain and you're being, in fact, becoming uh, as bad as the people you're trying to support because the association is now so close, then the effort has to be made to see if you can find through Kofi's plan mm -hmm. and the other kinds of arrangements are there a way forward which doesn't leave you in the end, holding the bag, which is, I think, where, they, where they're going. If Mazen is half right, and if the international community is willing to push, and they may have to, and I've spent a lot of my life in the Security Council, yeah. but they may have to push beyond the Security Council if it's a block uh, and institute sanctions which are unilateral, uh, but on which we could hopefully persuade Turkey and maybe Jordan uh -huh. and maybe even Iraq to shut the land borders, and okay. maybe we could institute a quarantine with NATO. I mean, there are All right. things that could be done. Maybe we can institute air traffic control arrangements in the neighborhood, which make it very hard for people to fly to Syria unless they're delivering humanitarian relief, which I wouldn't interrupt. All right. I want to get to something that the Russian President Vladimir Putin had to say about the situation in Syria. Let's, it's a very short uh, soundbite. Let's listen to it. We will do everything we can to solve this conflict and to use political means. This was the basis of our talks, to find a political solution. Overall, I believe that's possible. As for supplying weapons, Russia does not provide weapons that could be used in a civil conflict. John Altman, that is a much different, I mean, in tone, it's very different from what Russia has been saying, right? Yeah, I, I think the Russians are willing to serve Russian interests however they think they can best do it. I don't think they see Bashar al-Assad as a, a, a deep strategic ally that they need. I think they see interests in the eastern Mediterranean. They see interests in not having U.S. allies running the table and everything. They, they have a lot of complex interests, but I think they have national ambitions. Right. They have interests to protect. I think you can have a dialogue with Russia, and if you're willing to let Russia have its way on, on, on some issues, I think we could... You could have a settlement. We, we, and we could, yeah. could further our interests and their interests at the same time. Okay. And a lot of those interests we, aren't we, incompatible. Okay, we, we are, uh, Moses, we are go ahead. so much... Yeah. We, 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 we've been talking to Russia since the beginning of this uh, uprising and revolution. I mean, how much longer uh, do we need to keep going for them to see the realities on the ground? You have firm evidence that the UN Human Rights Watch has put together published reports, lists of names of individuals who've ordered the shooting uh, of protesters who have committed right. crimes against humanity. Is Russia going to continue to be the sponsor, as Ambassador Pickering earlier pointed to, okay. of this criminal 
uh, regime. It just doesn't make okay. sense. Okay, I think we, you've got a, a fracture yeah. in the Russian position. Right. I, I think it began yeah. with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov right after the veto uh -huh. rushing to Damascus to see if he could extract something. He right. failed. He extracted lip service for the Anon position. Now you have Putin supporting the Anon position, not Assad. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we have to continue to keep the pressure on. I thought the secretary okay. was very wise in what she said yesterday. All right. Well, and and we I thought Putin... Well, I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. Well. We've, we've run out of time. Thanks to all of you. <laughs> Time's caught up with us again. Thank you. And that is it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And, of course, we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. And uh, you can send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net.